Next steps in campaign to make Ontario disability accessible. What goals? What strategies? David Lepofsky, Chair, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Delivered at the Osgoode Hall Law School, February 4th, 2014, as a Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow. Good afternoon, everyone. In this, the final lecture in this series of accessibility advocacy lectures that I'm giving during my, my, my time at Osgoode Hall Law School as the Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow, I want to talk to you about what the immediate next challenges are that Ontario's disability community is facing, what our priorities are for action, and how you can help. Now the ideas I'm going to share are tied right to the events of today, February 4th, 2014, but for those who watch this on video sometime in the future, these will be relevant at any time with some tweaking. I've had the privilege for the past 19 years of working with a wonderful community of people with disabilities, people without disabilities, and community organizations with a single goal in mind. Our dream is to achieve a province of Ontario that is barrier free for all people with a physical or mental, mental or sensory, or learning, or intellectual disability. Let me take just a moment to tell you what the challenge is that we've faced and where we're at right now. Other lectures in this series go into great detail on how we've come as far as we have, what we've gained, what our tactics have been. And today I want to focus on what's next and to talk about rolling up your sleeves to get active uh, in this campaign. But I've got to take just a minute to capture where we are and, uh, and uh, what the problems are that we've been facing. People with disabilities are a huge group of folks. We're everywhere. And we face barriers everywhere we go. The problem is that even though those barriers are illegal under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees equality without discrimination because of disability, and the Ontario Human Rights Code, which protects against discrimination because of disability, even though they're illegal, too often they're still remaining in place. And even as we tear down old barriers, new ones too often are popping up. This led people with disabilities 19 years ago in Ontario to start first as a small group and then to grow into a, a large, tenacious coalition to fight for a new law, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And after a 10 years battle at the grassroots using some of the strategies I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes, we won that legislation and we won it with all party approval. It requires Ontario to become fully accessible by 2025. It requires the Ontario government to lead us to that goal. It requires the government to, buy, to do that by, to achieve that by two principal actions. The government has to make accessibility standards to tell organizations what they've got to do to find the barriers they have, to remove them along reasonable timelines, and to prevent the creation of new ones. And once those standards are enacted, it requires the government to effectively enforce them. The legislation has all the legal bones in it we need. What's the problem? The problem is, Nine years have passed since it was enacted. Eleven years are left till the deadline for its goals to be achieved. And we are behind schedule. In another lecture in this series, I go through in detail why and how we're behind schedule. But from this point, or at this point, let me just tell you, we are not on schedule. If every organization that has to act under the AODA does absolutely everything they have to do under the accessibility standards that have been enacted to date in areas like customer service, employment, transportation, the built environment, uh, and information communication. If they honor it to the letter, we will not achieve a fully accessible Ontario by 2025. Indeed, we won't achieve an accessible Ontario ever because those standards don't go far enough or fast enough, or cover enough. They're helpful. 
we should be proud of what we've won, but we've got a long way to go. So, any community advocacy organization can't just complain. We've got to come forward with an agenda, and we've done that. We've come forward with a series of priorities for action that we are urging all Ontario political parties uh, to adopt. Let me just explain them to you, and I'm going to spend the rest of our time together talking about what you can do to help make these priorities a reality. By the way, our aim is to ensure that our priorities can appeal to any party and any politician, whatever be their political strife. Stripe, pardon me, because political strife we have enough of, but whatever be their political stripe. Because we are nonpartisan. And we want, just as the AODA was passed unanimously, we want whatever government is in power to implement it effectively. So we try to appeal to everyone. We also live in a real world where the government has a significant debt and deficit problem. So we want to come forward with an agenda that is affordable and that the government can't simply slough off by saying, great idea, but we don't have the dough. Here goes. The first priority, and I'm not necessarily listing these in terms of order of what should be done first, but the first that we put on our list is that the government has to finally keep its promise, its up till now broken promise, to effectively enforce the Disabilities Act. We have learned through our own efforts, through our own freedom of information request that we had to pursue last year, that the Ontario government knows that there is rampant violations of at least one accessibility standard, one that we know of, um, and that, uh, that they are not acting effectively to enforce, even though they got the power and the money to do the enforcing. What am I talking about? First accessibility standard passed in 2007 is the Customer Service Accessibility Standard. It requires organizations in the public and private sector to develop an accessibility policy train their staff on it, and have a feedback mechanism for you or I if we run into problems. They gave the private sector all the way from 2007 to the end of 2012 to take those simple steps. But the private sector was also, the public sector had to be uh, up to speed by 2010. The private sector, if you were an organization with 20 or more employees, you had an obligation also by the end of 2012, it's over, it's over a year ago, to file a self-report electronically with the government, simply reaffirming that you've done what you're supposed to do. What we learned last November through our Freedom of Information application is that fully 70% of Ontario private sector organizations with 20 or more employees have not even filed that report. Well, if they haven't done that simple act, one is left wondering what else they haven't done under this standard. Moreover, the government's known about this. In fact, the, file, the failure to file rate was even higher at the start of 2012, and the government knew about that. We found out also that even though the government has the power to undertake inspections, conduct audits, and to issue compliance orders, and indeed to get monetary uh, penalties, they hadn't done any of that with the private sector as of last November. None. Rampant violations. No effective enforcement using those tools. Now, were they out of money? No, we found out that the government branch that was given a budget for implementing the Disabilities Act, including enforcement, was under budget every year since 2008. And the total under budget, that's money they're given and don't spend. And by the way, government departments aren't notorious for getting budget and not spending them. They've been under budget for a total sum over that period, not per year, but total of 24 million bucks. A lot of enforcing could have been going on. So what have we done? We are calling on all political parties to commit now to the effective enforcement of this act. As of now, the minister responsible, the enforcer in chief, Dr. Eric Hoskins, has on the one hand withheld all this information until we kept pushing the freedom of information request. We were seeking it since last January, uh, January of 2013. He has told the legislature last, fall, last summer that accessibility is a top priority for him and his government and has said that he, as of November, has a plan for enforcing. But the only thing he's announced was that they were going to write compliance demand letters 
to, I think it was 2,500 of the 36,000 non-compliers. And that's only dealing with one of the five standards they've enacted. We've also learned, when we've pointed this out over and over, that there, if you encounter a barrier and you want to let someone in the government know, so the branch responsible enforcing this act or the ministry can maybe look at that information, decide if they get enough feedback that it's time for an inspection, it's time for an audit, there's no phone number for you to call. And last Friday, uh, or probably last Wednesday in the Globe and Mail, or probably the Toronto Star on the front page, uh, there was a report about a barrier that a woman faced in using public transit in Ontario. We were quoted saying, I was quoted saying, that we, don't, we need a phone number to call. Not that they're going to send an enforcement person out on every call, but at least to be able, so they can track and decide when to enforce. And a spokesperson for, for uh, Minister Hoskins basically said, well, we make standards. We don't deal with individual complaints. Go to the Human Rights Tribunal and file your own. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the thrust of it. They forgot why they passed this act. The reason the Disabilities Act was passed was so that you and I didn't have to go and fight individual barrier against individual barriers, one human rights complaint at a time, one organization at a time. That's the very reason why the government said it was passing this law. We have to have the recourse to the Human Rights Tribunal if we need it, but we shouldn't have to rely on that as our main way of enforcing. They promised effective enforcement. So what have we proposed? We proposed there should be a call-in number. We proposed the government should be loud and clear with the public, including the uh, public and private sectors, that they're going to enforce. We've proposed that they should be actually acting on these cases of non-contravention or of contravention and using their audit and inspection powers. But recognizing that they have limited resources, we've offered other practical suggestions. The government has a number of inspectors under a number of different laws that inspect um, for, for environmental reasons, for occupational health and safety reasons, there's for health care reasons, tons of them. We've asked the government to deputize them as Accessibility Act inspectors. Give them a checklist. When they go into an organization for any other reason, let them check out the organization's compliance on the Disabilities Act too. All it requires is training and direction to go do it, not zillions of new inspectors. We've been proposing that for, oh, I think over two and a half years, and we're still waiting. But that's our first pri our, our, the first priority I want to list for you, getting the Disabilities Act effectively enforced. The second area that we, I want to turn your attention to, the second uh, area for action that is a huge priority for us is that we need new accessibility standards. The government picked five good ones to make first back in 2005, 2006 in the areas of customer service, employment, transportation, built environment, and, uh, and information and communications. But they don't cover the full range of barriers. And under the AODA, the government is obliged to make all the standards it needs to make to get us to full accessibility by 2025. We, a couple of years ago, identified the three ones that we want made next. That's not the three last ones, there could be more after that, but the three ones we want made next deal with barriers in education, preschool, school, post-secondary school. No one has looked at our education system top to bottom to root out barriers. There's been some progress, but we won't have a fully accessible uh, education system by 2025 or ever without something new. I'm pleased to inform you that we've got some allies in this cause. Four major organizations on our side. Publicly, we've got the uh, Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. That's the union that represents public school elementary school teachers. The Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. They represent the, um, uh, the public high school teachers. We've got the um, Ontario English Catholics Catholic Teachers Association, representing elementary and secondary school English Catholic teachers. And we have the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Association, which speaks at Queen's Park 
for university professors around the province. So, so many of these organizations which speak for those who deliver education on the front lines. They're not saying, we're doing a great job, we don't need to do any more students with disabilities there. They've got it, there's no problems. They're saying, no, we need more. And so education being pivotal to everybody is one of the three we've called for. The second accessibility standard we've called for deals with healthcare. We all need a, a healthcare system we can use. Like our education system, our healthcare system is publicly funded. And yet, while we're paying the money, we're not getting an assurance that people with disabilities could fully and equally use it. This is especially a cruel irony in the case of the healthcare system, because if you look at the statistics, who disproportionately uses the healthcare system? When do you use it the most? Well, on average, it's in, the, you're in your senior years when you're acquiring disabilities. So a system that is predominantly or disproportionately there to serve people with disabilities is far from barrier free. What could be done? Again, no one's looked at our healthcare system, even though there's been some progress, nobody's looked at it from top to bottom and said, where are the barriers? Who's got it right? Where can we replicate good ideas and, and move things forward? Um, can you imagine the government using our money to buy diagnostic equipment for a hospital, but not ensuring, not requiring that it be accessible? That's the world we're in right now. Number three residential housing. We all need our health. At some point in our life, we all need education, and we all need a place to live. There is a housing crisis facing people with certain, excuse me, kinds of disabilities. And we don't have, the government recently passed amendments to the building code to deal with accessibility. They only deal with new construction and renovations, and they don't ensure fully accessible housing construction, even in new builds. And what that means is that while we continue to have a province full of houses and apartments that are, have barriers in far too many cases, we have no assurance that we're building enough new housing stock that will be accessible. Now, are we proposing that uh, uh, an individual homeowner should be forced by law to renovate their own house even if they don't need accessibility? No, we're not. But what we are suggesting are a number of ideas, and a, a, a residential housing accessibility standard could go further beyond these. These are just to give you a, a hint of, of what we could look to. How about requiring that when a developer goes to their municipality or wherever to get approval to develop a bunch of houses or townhouses, that a certain percentage of them be required to be accessible? Not all of them, but a certain percentage of them. Let's increase our accessible housing stock. How about this? If you or I want to renovate our house to make it accessible or put a ramp at the front, we should be able to have legal protection that cuts the red tape that you may run into with zoning or other restrictions to enable you to do it. Let's get the legal barriers out of the way. How about this? If you own a condo, a condominium, in a condominium structure, you shouldn't have to get the approval of the board of directors in order to make an accessibility change in your own or around your own unit. When you work in a workplace, if you have a disability, you don't have to have a referendum of all your coworkers before your, your boss can give you um, uh, accessibility supports. It should be no different when you live in a condo. Let's get rid of some of those legal barriers. Those are just some ideas. If a municipal housing authority is renovating um, uh, its own housing stock for public housing, they should be required to increase their stock of housing, of public housing that's accessible. Those are just a few ideas. We've called for these three standards to be made. The government is taking longer to decide which standards next to make than they actually take to develop an entire standard. A year ago, they set up a new council with a mandate, or a revamped council, with a mandate to make all new accessibility standards. They said they were gonna decide which standards to make based on what they've already gathered in terms of information. It's a year later. The clock is ticking, 2025 is approaching. 
The third area of priority we, we're focusing on is this. The government has an important power to make change beyond regulations and enforcement. They've got a lot of public money and a lot of people out there who want their money. The government spends billions every year on capital infrastructure, on buildings and on, renovate and on structures, capital infrastructure around the province, not just government buildings. Universities come to government saying, hey, we want a new building, will you pay for it? Hospitals, schools, lots of municipalities. There's lots of this out there. And every year we hear governments talking about their, their huge infrastructure budgets. Similarly, the government spends billions every year on buying goods and services. We don't want to alter that budget, but we want the government to attach one string. And the string would provide this. If you want our money, you've got to commit that you will not use one dime of it to either create a new barrier or perpetuate or exacerbate an existing barrier. Don't use our money to make things worse. The government said they would do something like that in terms of new inf capital infrastructure uh, a couple of years ago, but we haven't seen the details or the teeth. In procurement, they say they're trying to ramp it up and an accessibility standard addresses it, but in general language. We want to see real action. We want to see senior cabinet ministers out there saying this. You want our money? Show us your plans to make sure you don't use our money to make things worse. Let me give you an illustration that will hit home in Toronto. This is 2014, in the summer of 2015. Toronto will be hosting the 2015 Pan and Parapan American Games. The public, including the government, is spending a lot of money on these games. We've called on the government to ensure that there is a strong accessibility legacy. It's not just a question of making sure that, that the housing where the athletes will live will be accessible, that the stadiums where they will perform uh, or compete will be accessible. We want a legacy of accessibility. The government had a press conference in, the, in August of 2013. Big ballyhoo, all sorts of performing and so on to announce the legacy of the games. This is why you, the taxpayer, should be happy we're spending millions of your dollars on these games. Here's what's going to be benefits for Ontario that will be left behind when the games are over. Nothing about disability accessibility, zero. And we, if you follow us on Twitter, at AODA Alliance, you will find out that there is, that we've been raising this time and again. Now, now they're starting to dribble out little bits of information, but nothing comprehensive, nothing good enough. And we've told the government in no uncertain terms, 2015 is halfway between 2005 when the Disability Act was passed and 2025 when we have to reach full accessibility. At present, Toronto will not be halfway to full accessibility in 2015. There are two options before the government. Plan for accessibility, an accessibility legacy now so when the world comes to Toronto, they see a city that is well on the way, it's on schedule or even ahead of schedule or have them come to Toronto and see what we experience now. Too few restaurants that we can get into if we have a mobility disability, a TTC where you can't count on the escalators or the subway or the, or the elevators to work reliably, um, um, limited amount of places to stay that are accessible, and lots of other barriers like that. We want the government to, in, to focus on infrastructure and on service and facility accessibility and for example, the government should make it clear that they will not allow any public events to be held at any premises that is not fully customer service and built environment accessible. And tell the, the private sector that now so they can get ready. The government should also be telling the thousands of employees and work and volunteers who will be involved with the game, encouraging them not to frequent non-accessible places. Let's let our money talk. It's good for our economy. The more restaurants and hotels and other tourist destinations that make themselves accessible, the more access to the tourist dollar they get. There are a billion people with disabilities around the world. Let's make our community a place they want to come to. So that's our third priority. That's not all. Our fourth priority is accessible elections. P voters with disabilities face too many barriers when either trying to get into a polling station, in terms of physical access barriers, 
or being able to mark their ballot independently and verify their choice independently and in private. As a blind person, I can't go to any polling station that I happen to live right near and be able to mark my own ballot alone. I have to have someone help me. The government bought fancy accessible voting equipment, but it's not available on election day, only advanced polls, and only in one or two locations per riding. And some ridings are pretty huge. We have a solution. We're proposing that the government make available telephone and internet voting. Won't be the solution for everybody, but it will help lots of people. We also don't think it should be limited to voters with disabilities. We think it would be something that everybody would like. 44 Ontario municipalities already use web or phone voting or both. City of Toronto right now is considering it as well. Ontario lagging way behind. We fought for amendments to our Elections Act in 2010. We got weak amendments that let Elections Ontario study it and test pilot it. Elections Ontario took a leisurely three years to study it and recommended, get this, more study. Moreover, Elections Ontario has had the power to test pilot it in a by-elections for two years, and they've refused to do so, even though we've had several by-elections, including one coming up. We want the legislature to intervene. If it's good enough for 44 municipalities around Ontario, it's good enough for all provincial voters. We want it to be safe and secure, but right now, Elections Ontario and the legislature will tolerate us having mail-in ballots, which have the wonderful security of Canada Post, or the security of your counter at home if a mail-in ballot happens to be sitting there and someone decides to grab it, mark it, and mail it in before you notice it's missing. So don't apply a double standard to us on security um, when, when mail-in ballots have been considered tolerable um, for a number of, of years now. So is that all? There are other priorities. I'm just going to mention one more, though we've got several on our website, but there's one more that should be just so easy. You've often heard that we need to raise awareness. I'm not big into that as a solution. We need laws that'll solve our problems, but there are a few areas where targeted, and, I, and listen, public education and accessibility is always great, and it could always help. But we want to target two particular audiences. And the current Ontario government, the Conservatives, promised they would, at least that they would try to make progress on this in 20, 2007. It's been seven years, and we're still waiting. Number one, school kids. We'd like to have a mandatory curriculum in school on accessibility. Let's get them while they're young. Get them on our side to understand the importance of this so when the next generation grows up, they don't make the same mistake that all previous generations have. And the other important audience are key professionals. We think that before you can get a license to be an architect, you should at least be required to learn how to design a building that everyone can use. Same for lawyers, in terms of knowing about accessible services. Same for doctors, social workers, and a wide range of other professionals. The government doesn't set their education standards, but can advocate, excuse me, to organizations, self-governing professional bodies, that they include this in their curriculum. The government said they would in 2007. We're still waiting. 2025 is getting closer and closer. And we've, lo we're run, we've run out of time to get this going. It's time for action now. Now, if you look at everything I've just talked about, enforcement, they've got more budget than they spent. New standards, that's part of the role of the government. And they've set up a body to create them. Moreover, a health care and an education standard we say should be de designed, we acknowledge will be designed, based on the existing health care and education budgets. We just want them spent smarter. Getting people teaching this in schools? Well, folks, think about it. We already have the schools. Let's just get the curriculum tweaked. We think that students and teachers will like it. Architects learning how to design a building that's accessible? Any architect students doesn't like the idea. Maybe they should find another profession. <laughs> but in any event, I don't know that any of them won't like it. I think they would. Um, Having delivered training on accessibility to law students, lawyers, and judges, I find the audiences receptive. We just have to mandate it so we make sure we get it 
to everyone. Well then, so we've got a pretty tough agenda of things to do. Tough not in the sense that they're tough things to do, but they're important things that aren't being done. What do we do about it? Let's spend the rest of our time talking about that. The most important message I can offer you is this. Our success on this depends, oh, does this sound like a guilt trip, on you. How do I know that? Because our coalition and its predecessor have been waging this accessibility campaign for 19 years. From 1994 to 2005, the, our predecessor, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee, fought across the province at the grassroots to get this legislation passed. Its successor coalition, the AODA Alliance, which I also chair, the, A the ODA committee having wound up, um, it's been raging a nine-year campaign to get the law effectively implemented. We've made enormous progress. Getting the law passed and unanimously is, in retrospect, something of which we should all be very proud. And while we're behind schedule for implementation, we've got more attention on and action on accessibility in Ontario right now than we would have had without it and than we've ever had before. But the key to it has been folks just like you, individuals, young, old, really young, really old, and all points in between. People who don't know anything about community organizing, people who don't know anything about law, people who've never gotten on a, uh, on a TV or radio program before, people who may never have written a newspaper column before, people who've never possibly talked to a politician before, but who decided to get active. Our biggest barrier to success are people who think there's nothing I can do and there's no point in trying. I'm proud that the coalition that I serve and its predecessor has spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, and had a lot of success in disabusing people of that sense, of that feeling. You might initially think that you need a law degree and all these years of training and speaking and public advocacy and, 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 and all these uh, to, to be able to do this, but frankly, frankly, the most effective people who get the message across are John Q. Public or Joan Q. Public, with or without a disability. If you got a disability, you're talking about your own experience. If you don't have a disability, you're going to get one later. It happens to all of us. So you have the same interest we do in winning this battle. I've been to the legislature, seen a number of bills go through the legislature, and sometimes they hold what are called public hearings, where they invite members of the public to come in and make formal speeches presentations, what's good or bad about the bill, what should be changed. Now you might think that politicians give a preference to hearing and are most interested in hearing from well-oiled organizations with glossy briefs who have um, slick and detailed presentations. The reality is the reverse. If you ever want to watch politicians really sit forward and listen, watch what happens when it's a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa of a kid with a disability who just comes in and says, let me tell you about the barriers facing my child or my grandchild. When it's a, a woman with a disability who talks about her getting parking tickets when she parks in an accessible spot, trying to fight against parking tickets she got when she parked in accessible spots. And she has a disability permit on her vehicle. I gotta tell you, that's what they remember. The real life, real human experiences. So what do you do? You have several avenues. Let me tell you the avenues, and let me offer you some specific suggestions. The avenues that we have right now are, number one, elections. As I'm speaking, there is a by two by-elections in Ontario in the Thornhill and Niagara Falls riding taking place on February 13th, 2014. Even if you don't live in those ridings, there are one tweet, one phone call, one fax, or one drive away for many people to get involved. More about what to do in a minute. We're expecting, there's a real possibility, though it's certainly not a certainty, a spring election, and if there isn't, there'll be one sometime after that. Using the tips that I'm gonna talk about in the by-election, equally apply in full elections. Between elections, and whether or not there's an election, 
you've always got access to your member of the Ontario legislature. And that is an avenue that we have used across the province, regardless of party. We are nonpartisan. We don't try to elect or defeat anyone. Uh, you vote however you want. It's none of our business, but it's worth visiting politicians and candidates, whatever be their party. There are two other avenues for input this spring. Under the Disabilities Act, the government is required every few years to appoint an independent person to see how we're doing under the Act, whether we're on schedule, and what needs to change. The most recent independent review was appointed last summer, about 102 days after they were legally obliged to be appointed. The reviewer appointed is a fabulous choice, Dean Mayo Moran, M-A-Y-O Moran, M-O-R-A-N. She's the Dean of Law at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. She's inviting public input. She's gonna hold public consultations. Let her know what you think. And you don't have to be with an organization, you can be an individual. The final avenue for input is this. Right now, even though the government isn't developing any new standards, they, have, they are required to have the 2007 customer service standard, accessibility standard, reviewed. The body that is reviewing it is called the Accessibility Standards Advisory Council, ASAC, and uh, it will be inviting public input later this spring. So those are the avenues. Elect by election, upcoming general election, reaching out to members of the legislature, whether or not there's an election, the Mayo Moran Independent Review, the Customer Service Standard Review. So what do you do? Let me give you some, now we turn to the what you personally could do using to travel in one or more of those avenues. Anything you can do from this list helps. First things first. We strongly invite you, encourage you to sign up for AODA Alliance email updates. For anybody watching on video, you send a request. All you have to say in the subject line is sign me up and you email it to this email address, aodafeedback at gmail.com, aodafeedback at gmail.com. We send emails once, sometimes twice, maybe on occasion three times a week, sometimes not at all during the week, to let you know what we're up to, what are the new issues, seeking your feedback, inviting your input, never seeking your money, by the way, and also offering you action tips. More about that in a minute. So follow our, get our, sign up for our email updates. We have people following us from all around the world and share them with your friends. Forward them to friends, post them on your Facebook page, cut and paste from them, use them as you wish, spread the word. That's how we won the Disabilities Act, was through that kind of activity. Next, follow us on Twitter. Two Twitter handles. For the Alliance, it's at AODA Alliance. For me personally, at David Lepofsky, L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y. We also, our tweets go out on our Facebook page. Would you please, we invite you to like our Facebook page and share our posts with as many people as you can. As a long name, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. We need a shorter name. But just by signing up, retweeting, sharing our posts, forwarding our email updates to friends, organizations you're involved in, family, politicians, and the media, that alone really helps. What can you do specifically in the by-election or in an upcoming election? We distribute on our email and on our website, by the way, all our posts end up on our website, it's www.ao daalliance.org, aodaalliance.org. What we do when major events like a by-election or election come is we put up an action kit. And in a few pages, it tells you everything you need to know. What are the issues? What actions do we propose you to take? Now, of course, you're welcome to take whatever issues you want public. If we don't cover them, go add to them. That's the joy of democracy and community organizing. Let us know what you're up to in case something we didn't think of that might really be cool to add. For example, we have an election action kit out for the by-election. 
We identify five questions to ask politicians, drawn from that list of priorities I reviewed. It is easy to cut and paste them into an email and send them to the candidates. We encourage you to do that. It's also easy to phone a candidate's office, ask for a campaign worker, they will perhaps not know anything about this issue, and ask them the questions. They may say, I gotta get back to you on it, but offer to send them the action kit and uh, connect them up with our website because there are more resources available. We've had people do this. They've gone to candidate after candidate to campaign office after campaign office. If you can go to more than one, that's great. If you can only go to one, that's way better than going to none. Use social media to spread the word. I've talked about it, but I really want to amplify it. Social media is a free and effective way to reach more and more people. Grab our posts or our tweets and share them around. Add your own comments. Send your own. The more activity on, in this area, uh, the better. The hashtags, if you're a Twitter junkie, uh, in this area are hashtag accessibility or hashtag AODA, both work. So then, what else can you do? Well, we need the media. We need media coverage. Now, you might think, I can't go get media coverage. I don't, you know, I'm just an individual. Well, there is a lot you can do. See, the media, as I've said often during these, election, th these lectures, the media doesn't cover issues. They cover events. If you call up a good news organization and say, breaking news, people with disabilities face barriers in Ontario, uh, you'll lose them. But on the other hand, when some uh, parents of kids with autism who have a problem with their school board uh, uh, raise it with the media, it became a big story uh, a couple of days ago in the Toronto Star. Their children with autism benefit substantially from a service dog that helps calm and focus them so that they can take part in activities like schooling. They wanted to take their dogs to school, their, their service dog to school. School boards had to wrestle with how to accommodate. And the Toronto Star article reported that some got a welcoming reception and they worked it out. Others, it took a year and a lot of hoops to go through without an effective resolution. And the Toronto Star article provided a platform for us to then, we didn't take the story, the story uh, came from these individuals, but then it led us, when we were approached, to say, this shows why we need an education accessibility standard. Each school board shouldn't be reinventing this wheel. Each parent shouldn't have to fight this battle alone. Now, to get those stories in the press, we need you. We need individuals who face barriers, individuals who have friends facing barriers, individuals who have witnessed barriers, even if they don't hurt them, but they think it's wrong for them to be there, to take those stories to the press. The media focuses on individual incidents, and that becomes a platform to address the broader issue. It's great during an election to bring these up at all candidates' debates, but it's great to just call up the assignment desk at a radio or TV uh, or news station or a news, uh, newspaper to raise these. Well, you might find out that the media sometimes doesn't pick up your story. That's not the end of it. Because the beauty of the world we now live in is that there are avenues for you to get to the public through various forms of media without having to, well, being able to bypass the assignment desk in some news organizations. How do you do that? One great way is call in radio. Call in radio stations, talk radio. That's all people do is talk. They call in, so phone in and tell them about a barrier you face. And even encourage them to do a, a, a show or a half an hour on that topic. Um, that's easy, it's free, and it's readily available. Another opportunity, if it's a newspaper that hasn't been covering your story that you want to take them to, letters to the editor. Or call up and ask about writing a guest column. We've had our supporters around the province write guest columns over the year. And I'm not talking about people who graduated with degrees in, in, in journalism. I'm talking about people who've got no training in this at all. Just tell your story. Talk about what's wrong. Borrow liberally from AODA Alliance materials, and we don't need any credit. We will never complain that people used our stuff. We will be delighted. 
I'm happiest when we're not attributed. If we say it well and you like to use it, don't worry, we're delighted. If you want to change the wording around, that's good too. But we're, we encourage you to use our material on our website or our email updates. These are all ways that you can spread the word. Let me conclude with a couple of thoughts. There are, are more and more strategies on our website, but these are just a few examples. If you're going to a politician, tell them individual stories about barriers and then present them with the issues that we've got. If you're going to the media, tell them about the barriers uh, that you face or that you know someone faces. Um, and then talk about the broader issue, about no enforcement of the AODA or about needing new accessibility standards. Don't make it all bad news, of course. If there's good news about a barrier that you managed to overcome at one university, bring it to the media in order, or put it out on Twitter or on a, a blog so you can say, hey folks, here's a solution that works. If only we had an education accessibility standard, we could use this across the province. Turn your successes into an advocacy effort, uh, not just, uh, not just the, the bad news, the important bad news, but the bad news of more and more barriers. So, let me conclude, let me conclude this way. This to the average individual seems, uh, can often seem way more than they're ready to deal with. They're busy, they're tired, they face too much, they're busy at school or at work or with family, and they got a million things to do. Another thing to do is just one more and it can't be done. And as I said earlier, a sense that what difference can I make? Well, I want to tell you that when we started in, uh, as 20 people meeting in a room at Queen's Park in 1994, when we started the, the grassroots movement that grew into the, the Disability Act advocacy uh, initiative that we are today, none of us had any expectation we'd succeed. And anybody looking on would say, there's just no hope. You'll never unite the disability community. You'll never get anyone to listen. And somebody looking that cynically at us, frankly, would be right. It was totally impractical, if not impossible. Once we formed, and when we got to the spring of 1995, as a tiny little coalition, it would be reasonable in some thought, we could never get a commitment from a political party on our agenda. We got commitments from two of the parties in, 95, in the 95 election, and every election since, at least two parties have made commitments to us, sometimes three. After the election in 1995, Mike Harris, the conservative uh, pre premier, was elected. He promised a disability act, but had a dis an anti-regulation agenda, and people thought, it, there's no way you'll ever get a law out of him. It took years, the law he passed was inadequate, but in 2001, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act 2001 was passed. When it was passed, it being way less than we needed, some people looking on would have said, or did say, the disability community is going to give up. They held together for, for six years. They got a very weak law. They're going to move on to other things. Anyone who thought that turned out to be wrong. Our community stayed together. We got commitments in 2003 election for a stronger Disability Act. Now, some people thought after the 2003 election, maybe Dalton McGinty promised a good act, but they won't deliver a good act. And after the years with the prior government and people being cynical about politicians, you could understand why they'd feel that way. But guess what? We kept it up. Grassroots advocates kept it up. Individuals, moms and dads and kids kept it up. And in 2005, we got all party support for a law that included the key, uh, key ingredients, I should say, that we wanted. So where are we now? On the one hand, we've got a series of standards that help, but rampant noncompliance under one standard, and we don't know yet about the others, but what is left to worry, in at, you know, way too little on the enforcement front, and delay by government in coming up with the next accessibility standard. So there's every reason to be as pessimistic as the people were in 94, or 90, I should say, as some people were in 94, or 95, or all the way up to 2001, or in 2003. But guess what? Those of us who were optimists, those of us who ignored all the good reasons to be pessimists, and who picked up that phone to call a politician, or went to visit a campaign office, 
or wrote a column for a newspaper or tweeted or posted on Facebook or whatever. Those people just kept it up. And they won each of those rounds. And I believe if we keep it up, we will won, win this round. Let me conclude with an entire, uh, uh, an analogy that all my environmentalist friends hate. We get a big, huge tree beside us here. A big, huge, strapping, tall tree. And I told you, you know, knock that tree down. You'd walk over and you'd put your hands and push on it. you go, it's impossible. If I handed you an ax and said, okay, now chop it down. If you took it one big, huge swing, you'd make a little dent. But we all know that a person can cut a tree down. If you swing that ax enough times, hard enough, properly aimed, you could chop that tree down. If we get two people and two axes, if they swing it the wrong way, they're going to hurt each other. But if they swing it the right way and work together, they'll cut down the tree in half the time. Every one of you, every one of you who retweets a tweet, that's a swing of the ax. Every one of you who decides to post something on Facebook to your friends about issues regarding accessibility, that's a swing of the ax. Every one of you that signs up for our email updates and then forwards them to your family and friends, and maybe some politicians or journalists. That's a swing of the ax. Every one of you calls a call-in radio station, that counts as about five or six swings of the ax. Every one of you goes to an all-candidates debate and gets up and raises this from the floor, these issues, from our action kit or, or your own issues. Yet more swings of the ax. And we know, just as you can be as confident as can be, that the impossible task of knocking down that tree is possible by enough well-coordinated swings of the ax. We know that by these efforts, we can get this law effectively enforced and we can get to our goal of full accessibility. Thank you very much for coming and I appreciate your taking the time to, to think about taking action on this important agenda.